My name's Gordon from Drayson Design. And I'm Taylor from The Creative Tinker. And welcome to This Week With, a weekly podcast and vidcast where two business owners talk about their business and things that affect them and things that have affected them in the last week. So, we hope you're all very well. Uh, it's been... Um, but the, the weather's changed a bit, hasn't it? Yeah, it's got a lot colder. It's got a lot colder. Uh, so we are um, starting to put the heating on, which we haven't done for a long, long time. And uh, I've got my jumper on today. I notice you've got a very nice Creative Tinker yeah. embroidered one. And today, look, this came this came in the post. This is my Drayson Design uh, hoodie, which was uh, sent to me by Rob Gaffney, who owns a company called Custom Shirts and More. And uh, I think it's great. It's very, very soft. It's very, very, um, very nice quality. And the embroidery is just excellent. So if you're looking for embroidered clothing, or, or other, he does other things as well. Printing. Um, printing on all sorts of things, mugs and all. Just go see his website, have a look. The link will be in the show notes. So, can I tell you about what I've been doing this week? What have you been doing this week? So I've got Airtable, which is a, an application that we've discussed in the past, and I use it to keep track of all my Drayson Design customers that host with me and have renewals that come up on a, um, a repetitive uh, interval, so like every year, for example. Yeah. And when I added everything, everyone to the system, I, uh, I made a little mistake. The mistake I made was that I looked for all of the renewals that were going to be from today onwards at the time I exported. Yeah. Which is fine for all of those ones that are not coming up yet. However, there were some renewals that hadn't been renewed but had already expired. Now, I always try and contact my customers when something like that happens just in case they haven't received... The email or they weren't aware of it um, if I haven't had any response to say yes I'd like to renew or no I don't want to renew it's always a good idea to to physically phone them up and uh, just or message them and just say you know you haven't responded D did you want to let this go or, or did you want to renew it um, and so that's what this system is basically set up to do however there were a few renewals that fell through the cracks because they had already expired and I hadn't had the renewal notification yet. So this week, I've been through and I've been looking at the ones that have fallen through the cracks, added them in, contacted them uh, personally just to say, look, this renewal was due, you know, back a few months ago. Did you want me to uh, to renew it for you? I've kept the services running. I uh, just wanted to check if you still needed them or not. So um, that was good. And something I noticed that uh, I know nothing about but Google have come out with their own version of Airtable. So Airtable is a bit like a database and a spreadsheet combined. Uh, it has functionality that you would get in both of those different types of application. And Google have come out with their own version. Uh, I'm going to look into it. And if it's something that I think will be of interest to our viewers, then I will tell you all about it on this podcast. So... That's been pretty much the most important thing I've done over the last seven days. There's been lots of other things, like, just very quickly, I made a really nice photo book for my parents, which is a personal project. Uh, it was their 50th anniversary, and I took photos at their wedding anniversary, and as a present, I put it all together, had it properly printed into a lovely hardback book, and uh, that got given to them during the week, and they loved nice. it. It was very nice. Thank you. It was really good. Uh, some lovely photos and a nice keepsake, some, something they can put on their coffee table, and people can just have a look at when they come round to visit. Awesome. What have you been up to, Taylor? Um, so this week I have um, been on a bit of a spending spree. Oh. Um, kind of lifetime deals and software that can help me improve my workflow or uh, kind of speed it up or uh, improve the skills and the quality of my work. Um, and I, I bought a uh, course this week. Um, so not a software, a course. Um, and this is for... Um, animation so kind of uh, it's a uh, user the javascript library called gsap and what it allows you to do is it allows you to create really cool animations um, so uh, an example of this although 
um, they don't use it is Apple. So Apple's websites and their kind of uh, product pages are very in-depth, very uh, kind of uh, out, over the top and really nice to look at. As you, and as you scroll down the page, you know, you get animations where the, the, the laptop's opening up or you've got, um, you know, something spinning or whatever. And this is what this basically does. It's, um, it's similar to that um, kind of effect. Can I just point out, we're talking about animation for websites here, because you could be doing animation for video, but this is specifically for websites, yeah. right? Yeah, so it's kind of on-scroll animations as you scroll down, things move from left to right on the page. Which looks or... great, and it's nice to have interactivity, isn't it? Yeah, so um, I want to learn this to kind of improve my knowledge and skills and be able to offer a more complex and advanced and better service than my competitors that don't have this knowledge and can't offer stuff like this. And I think that uh, animation is very overlooked because too much animation and your website, it looks kind of outdated and very... Well, it looks gimmicky, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, but you know, having a small amount of animation that um, enhances and doesn't distract it but catches the eye yeah so that's one thing so kind of having animation that uh, helps you so you know maybe having um, an image sticky on the left hand side of the screen and as you scroll the text changes on the right but the image on the left stays the same and you get more information than what you would be able to see um, just by scrolling and it's um, a lot more compact and it's a lot nicer for the viewer because you know you don't feel overwhelmed with a big long page um, or you know, um, showing off something um, that you offer in an in a different way that your competitors would, and so it's giving you the edge and the uh, differentiating your customer your your website to your competitors. Um, so yeah, this is, so that was something I wanted to offer. So something I quite like is when you see on a shop page, for example, you can see the product image and the buy button with the price. And there might be a load of description, which might be several pages long. And if you can have that image and the price and the buy button stay on the screen and scroll down with you as the text scrolls up, it makes it uh, a much better user experience. And I think that's what animation needs to do. Yeah. It has to be, at the end of the day, it has to give the user a better experience, not just putting in there for the sake of it. Yeah, so it's, it's enhancing and making it it should be subtle enough that people don't realize that there is animation going on um, and that's that's what it should it should it shouldn't distract you from the main focal point of the website um, amazon do this a lot with their uh, product pages their image stays sticky on the left mm -hmm. and as you scroll down you can still see the image until you get to the bottom of the description yeah and um, they have been testing that we know because Amazon always tests, so it just goes to show they they improve their sales based on that. So that's done for not only a user experience, but to make more sales. Yeah. You know, a 0.1 of a percent more sales for Amazon is a huge amount. Definitely. We've said this before. So you about the, what about you this week? What's your topic? So my topic of the week is how to... Uh, increase your chances of getting emails opened okay now we all send emails uh, to customers sometimes they're new customers people that um, have only just joined you sometimes they are prospects so they're not customers yet and sometimes it's to customers who've been a customer for a long long time but every now and then you've got an email that you want to be opened for various reasons it might be that you've got a sale on and that's quite an important thing to let customers know about it might be that there's uh, an update to something to do with your your company and it's really important that your customers know about this update because it's gonna make sure that you haven't got to then support them in the coming months because they didn't read this email um, there's lots of reasons why you might want your emails opened and uh, if I do have a few maybe you can think of a few as well because I'm okay. sure you've got some so my number one tip would be to include the name of the person that you're sending the email to in the subject title now if you see your name in the subject title you assume it's not spam because most spam emails don't have your full name or your name uh, to any point where they'd actually want to use it it's normally very very generic so if you can put Taylor, 
we have some important information about your hosting. It's a lot more personal and you feel, even if it is a campaign, for example, and you've sent it out bulk to people, it still looks personal, looks like you sent it individually. That's right. And so if you've got the right software, you can actually use placeholders, a bit like um, mail merge on Word, Word um, I was going to say WordPress, then. mail merge on Word. Uh, if you've ever used that functionality and you're sending lots of letters out and printing them and you have a list of people and it just replaces the name and so on, it's exactly the same thing that you can do with emails. Uh, as long as you've got the right newsletter and sending service, they'll allow you to do that. MailChimp will allow you to do that, for example. Yes. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is you have some uh, a certain number of characters, and I don't know how many it is, which are shown as part of the message in an email client. The preview text. The preview text. Now, normally, it's the first, um, the first sentence or two of your content uh, that's used, but not always, because quite often, the first um, sentence of your content is going to be, if you can't read this, click here to see it in a browser. Yeah. Well, that's not what you want. That's not going to make people want to open the email. Uh, so there are uh, ways to create um, a preview text in addition to the normal email. So you can actually craft it properly to help it uh, help people who are receiving the email know what it's about and encourage them to open yeah. it. And that's a really, really big tip that. Um, I've got a, a, a one, is have your most important information above the fold. Um, for desktop, it's a lot easier. You have a lot more space. But for mobile especially, you have a certain height um, and space to show off what you offer or what you're trying to get across to your uh, client, customer, whoever it may be, um, and making sure that it grabs the attention. So making sure you've got a big, bold heading at the top with an image, maybe. And those two alone should grab the um, cl customer, client, and it should tell them what the whole email is about and should make them want to scroll further. Yeah, um, a bit like a newspaper headline does to grab you your attention and get you to read that article. It's exactly the same. Yeah. Same as you would on a web page, in fact. Yeah, definitely. Uh, another tip is if you are using images, which I, I recommend, uh, it, it does depend on what it is you're doing. Not always, uh, sorry, not, not, not every application uh, needs an email. If you're an affiliate marker, uh, marketer, then sending text-only emails has been proven to, to get more clicks. Um, I'm guessing it's because it downloads quicker and it gives them more chance to just, you know, be heavy with the copy uh, with a call to action in there. Um, personally, I, I like emails that look good. So, I mean, uh, we both have custom uh, signatures, which are not only the base of the uh, the last bit of the, um, the email where it has your name and, and your sign off. But it, it surrounds the whole of the content. So we've got a nice sort of graphic to show what the, uh, who the email has come from. Uh, we've got, you know, um, a background color. And it, this will only work with HTML emails and with HTML clients. But most of them are these days. Yeah. Uh, if you're viewing it on a watch, uh, which I don't think many people do, but if you're checking all your emails on your watch, you're not going to get your graphics showing well on there. So don't even bother with that. Um, another, I've got another tip. Yeah, go ahead. Um, is making sure your uh, images are hosted externally. Um, so this is what I find a lot is a lot of people that send emails that are just, you know, they're not um, kind of campaign emails or anything and they're just to customers or clients. Is they will put their logo in the their signature in the bottom. And every time they send this email, they are sending an attachment with their image logo. Yep. And it's it takes up space. So if you wanted to send a file to someone, you have already reduced the amount of the, the, the file size you can send because yep. of your logo. And, and if you've got several images and you're attaching all of them, all of a sudden you've got a load of space that's already taken up file size wise uh, that you can't then use for an, an actual attachment. Um, and the other thing is it takes longer because you have to um, fetch all the images and then download them. 
Whereas if you're loading them from uh, a website or a kind of CDN maybe, um, which is a content delivery network, which basically is a speed ca delivery, cache, a cached mm -hmm. version of the images, it's going to be a lot quicker to load all the images. And following on from that tip, which is great, is that if you make sure that when you specify an image within your email, you use a specific URL, it means that you can change that image anytime you like. So for example, if you've got a product image and it's got the price embedded in the image, then when you change the price of that product, all you have to do is to change the hosted image that you're sending in your emails and automatically anybody who receives an email from that moment on will get the new image with the new price. But this is the best bit. All of the previous people who've already received your email will see the new image. So as it's not attached to the email, it's just going to pull in the image from the, every time from the you... web server every time you open that email. And if you've got a new image with a new price, new contact details, whatever it is, that people who've got the email uh, six months ago, three years ago, they're going to see the up-to-date information, which is huge. It means yeah. your emails are always going to show the correct information, even if they open it from the past. You just need to make sure that the, um, the URL is the exact same. So you delete yes. the old version and upload it, because if you upload it while the previous is there, it will normally append like one next to Correct. it. And that won't work. So you need to make sure you delete the old one and re-upload it with the exact same file name. So if you're doing that on WordPress, the best way to do that is to put it into your media gallery. It will then give you a URL that you can use. And there is a plugin that you can get that allows you to replace images. And what it will do is it will just get rid of the one that's there, put the new one up and give it the same file name. And that's the best way of doing it. Uh, I have another one. Yeah. Um, if you have a video uh, that you want people to see in your email, do not include the video as an attachment. That's the worst thing you can do because it forces people to download the video whether they're going to watch it or not. And the quality is going to be very low because you've got a, about five megabytes or so that is guaranteed to get through on email, which is not very big. So the best way to do it is go to wherever you're hosting your, your, your video. It could be YouTube, Vimeo, anywhere like that, Wistia, and grab a screenshot of the player page. So basically the, the image of your, your video with the play button on it, use that image that's hosted on your website or somewhere on the web, use the URL of that image in your email and then your, your um, people open the email will see the image with a play button. They will assume it's a video that they need to, to click on the play button's important because that's what's going to get them to click on it. Yep. And as soon as they click on it, it will open a web browser, it will go to the right place and it will show your video no matter how long it is in the highest possible quality. And an advantage of that is you can host it on your website uh, and embed it into your website. And that means you've got them to your website and you know, you've got, you can from there direct them if it's a specific landing page, for example, that has a, a special discount or something you've got them on your website now and you can then direct them to whatever call to action you have set in place. Yeah. Now we've moved away a little bit from how to uh, encourage people to open your emails, but there's lots of really good best practices here. And uh, the last one that I think I've got, yeah, the last one is very similar to what you were just saying, is if you are linking to uh, content. So for example, you've got a price list and you have a PDF, again, don't include it in the email because it's going to be dated. Have a link that goes to a page on your website or even to the exactly to that PDF, although I know you don't like that version. Have a page or the PDF, put that link in. And again, when you want to update it, just update the page, just update the PDF. And then anyone who clicks on that link, even if they received the email three years ago, they will see your most up-to-date prices. And that goes for anything that you want to update. If it might be a, an ebook, for example, have a link, get them to go to that page, and then you can always update that ebook as things change. Yeah, so um, a, 
a bit uh, aside from email, but along the same type of lines, is um, one of uh, uh, someone I know, uh, Nick, he does uh, work for a uh, restaurant and they have a menu and it's in PDF format. And because of the current situation, it's kind of, you can't really have physical copies because of, um, you know, everyone's going to be touching them. So what he's decided to do is he's created a QR code. And in that QR code, it goes to forward slash our menu. And then all he does is he then redirects our menu to the that week's uh, PDF. And every week he just redirects our menu uh, link to the new PDF. And it means he doesn't have to, uh, you don't, he doesn't even have to have the same name of for the PDF because he can change where our menu, which is the base URL, gets redirected to. Yeah, that's good. There you go, a different option if you want to do that instead of uh, replacing files. That way you can keep copies and archives. And it's a lot simpler, so if you if they were to share it, you can say, you know, just go to forward slash ebook, um, whatever, and you know, no matter what, if they go to ebook, if you can then redirect them to the correct version or whatever, um, you know, it's a lot simpler and don't have to remember a long string with like .pdf at the end of the URL. And uh, last of all, uh, your signature is really important in an email. This isn't going to help you get your emails opened, but it is going to help people who want to contact you be able to do so. So make sure if you've got a Facebook page, put a Facebook logo in, link it through to Facebook. Same with Twitter, Instagram, any of the social medias, YouTube. Uh, plus your website, make sure you've got that there. And if you take phone calls, make sure your telephone number is there. And another thing is put your email address in. It may seem counterintuitive because you know, you've, you're know you you're sending them an email. However, if people share your, uh, your email, then they will see in the signature your email address. So it may will... not necessarily have the header being shared with your email address in it. So that's a very good point. Yeah, so they forward it. They're not going to have your email attached to it. But if your email is in the signature, they can always find you and contact you if they need to. There you go. So lots of lots of tips for you for emails. If you use any or you have any of your own tips, please leave uh, a comment and we will um, share that with, with our viewers. Wonderful. Taylor, have you got anything else you want to talk about? I think that's it really. I spoke about animation, uh, my new course, and I spoke about the importance of animation, which was... Uh, my topic for this week. So hopefully when uh, when he's had a chance to, to get to grips with the animation, uh, we'll be able to show you some examples sometime in the future. And maybe we'll come back to this yeah, and definitely. talk about how you're doing with the course. Yeah, wonderful. Great. Well, thank you for joining us. As always, if you would like to follow, like and subscribe, we can be found on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, that's This Week With. The links are on the page. Uh, and we also have our website thisweekwith.co.uk which has all our past episodes that you can view with audio, video and also the show notes. Uh, no search facility yet but that is something that we are planning on putting on so yes. uh, keep an eye out for that. So until next week, Friday at 1pm, we will see you then. Goodbye from me, I'm Gordon from Drayson Design. And I'm Taylor from The Creative Tinker. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.